Yeah, so as Patrick said, I'm going to be presenting the empirical analysis of anonymity in Zcash. This is a work we did with uh, Harun Yusuf, Mary Miller, and Sarah Mekeljohn, who are also from UCL. Sarah Mekeljohn is my uh, PhD supervisor. Uh, this work was done in 2018, and it was presented in um, Usenix Security 2018. Um, as the name suggests, we, in this paper, we try to measure uh, the level of privacy that Zcash users have. Um, this work was uh, after works that have been had uh, been done in Bitcoin that showed that uh, Bitcoin has severe limitation in terms of anonymity. So we basically, um, the short question we wanted to answer was how better it is than Bitcoin. So before diving into the details of uh, our paper, I would like to make a, a small uh, introduction uh, and go through uh, go with you th um, through the timeline of uh, anonymity in cryptocurrencies in general. So Bitcoin was introduced in 2008. It was the best, uh, the, the, the first uh, cryptocurrency that was created. It's still the, by far the most dominant one in terms of the market value. And in terms of its um, the anonymity, Bitcoin in its white paper stated the following, that Bitcoin is an anonymous currency. It has nothing to do with the traditional financial uh, system that we know. Because when a user interacts and sends money to uh, other users, he's not using his real life identity but rather he's using a public key um, that is uh, known in cryptography. So basically there's no way of knowing who transacts with whom because instead of you know, people using their actual identities, they use these public keys. Uh, but research showed otherwise. And in particular, there were a lot of papers that are, uh, attacked different layers of the Bitcoin um, protocol. The first paper I'm citing here, The Fistful of Bitcoins, is probably the most well-known um, paper that has to do with anonymity in Bitcoin because the, in this paper, the, uh, the authors developed uh, heuristics that cluster together different public keys that uh, presumably belong to the same entity. And these techniques are basically used up until today in order um, to um, argue about Bitcoin's anonymity. Other papers uh, attacked the network layer of the Bitcoin. And instead of using what's in the blockchain, they were using the communication that Bitcoin nodes have with each other in order to infer uh, very important information. So since Bitcoin uh, didn't go uh, so well in terms, of, uh, the, in terms of privacy, other cryptocurrencies were created um, that actually tried to tackle this problem that Bitcoin uh, had. So basically, these cryptocurrencies that I'm going to mention now were ha had a default, a built-in privacy that uh, aimed to be better than Bitcoin's. Dash, for example, was a, um, one of those uh, cryptocurrencies, and it relied, it still relies anonymity on so-called coin joint transactions. However, coin joint transactions suffer from a very important availability issue, uh, which made the Dash not the perfect, you know, solution for Bitcoin. It provided better anonymity, but not, we're not, we were not quite there yet. However, coin joints are still used today in, uh, in Bitcoin, uh, in, uh, uh, for example, in the Wasabi wallet. So people actually uh, still are, are still using coin joints uh, for, uh, uh, have, for having uh, extra anonymity. Another example was Monero. And Monero was based on a, a, a cryptographic uh, scheme called the Ring Signatures. And it uh, aimed, again, to provide a, 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 a better privacy-friendly alternative uh, to Bitcoin. But research showed uh, that this was not perfect as well. In this paper I'm citing uh, right here, it's actually a very good paper. They showed that the particular implementation of uh, the Monero nodes uh, leaked significant information regarding the transactions of the users. So there were, um, there were very you know, uh, effective attacks on Monero as well. So basically, we had Zcash. Prior to our work, there was not significant work done already in Zcash, and it was considered actually um, a very privacy-friendly cryptocurrency. First of all, it was established on, on uh, uh, it was based on very well-established cryptography, as we can see here. So it was very interesting to um, to, to look into it from the beginning. This screenshot was taken uh, actually a couple of days ago, and as you can see, Zcash in terms of its market value. It's currently in the 26th uh, position. And given that there are more than 2,000 cryptocurrencies out there, you can see that Zcash is still a very you know, top tier uh, cryptocurrency. Even Edward Snowden, who is considered to be you know, one of uh, the most influential people in the area of privacy, stated that in his opinion, uh, Zcash is the best privacy uh, private alternative to Bitcoin. 
So let me try and explain Zcash like in a nutshell here. So similar, uh, you have, uh, when we started, uh, when we did our paper, we had two types of addresses in Zcash. Currently there are three, but uh, I'm gonna explain later how this um, uh, affects our results. It actually doesn't affect it much. So basically we have the transparent addresses or key addresses and the private ones. The transparent addresses are, uh, uh, behave exactly the same way as they behave in Bitcoin. So basically users have their transparent public addresses that they can share with anyone they want. And when, you, when an observer looks at the blockchain, it's very important to realize that when they see a transparent a T address, they can, they can find all the transactions that are associated with, it, with, it, with this particular address. On the other hand, the Z addresses that were introduced in Zcash had the following very important feature. They were one-time addresses. Basically, this means that when um, a Z address is used in a transaction, there is no other transaction you can find that uses the same Z address. Basically, looking to the Z address means absolutely nothing. There's no meaningful, um, uh, you know, uh, there's no meaning in this uh, particular uh, type of address. So basically, having these two different ad uh, addresses, we can create four different types of transactions. The set of all the different Z addresses, we call them the shielded pool in order to make an easy abstraction on how Zcash works, as you can see in this figure. Basically, you have the transparent uh, transactions, and as I said, these ones behave exactly as in Bitcoin. There are transactions that have T addresses as inputs and T addresses as outputs. Also in these transactions, the values are all uh, uh, public, so you can see basically everything as you can see in Bitcoin. On the other hand, the most private transactions that someone could do in Zcash is seen with, is within a shielded pool. What I mean by that? In this type of transactions, both the inputs and the outputs are Z addresses. So you have no idea who is sending money to who. Also, you have no idea how much money is being sent because the actual values are hidden as well. This is done through cryptography and zero knowledge proof in particular, but I'm not gonna cover it uh, during this presentation. So basically you have the transparent addresses that have nothing to do with the shielded pool. You have the private ones that are uh, transactions that happen within the shielded pool. And you have two more types of transactions. The one that deposit money into the pool and the ones that withdraw money from the pool. When a transaction deposits money to the pool, you know what are the, who are the senders because the senders are the addresses. And you also know the values of the inputs, the values of the UTXOs that are being spent. However, you don't know how this money is spent, where this money goes. Similarly, in the withdrawal side, you have no idea who the input address, what the input addresses are. You don't know what UTXOs are being spent, but you know how are they spent because you know the output uh, side of this particular transaction. So. In terms of our contribution uh, in our paper, first of all, we performed a blockchain analysis on Zcash. We basically measured uh, the distribution of these different types of transactions in order to see what people preferred uh, to use, uh, transparent addresses, private addresses, and so on. Our second contribution is that we used the transparent transaction or the T2T ones to create clusters of users. Basically, we clustered together uh, different T addresses that we believe belong to the same entity. In order to do that, we used, of course, techniques that were already developed in Bitcoin, and in particular, they were developed in the paper I mentioned earlier, the fistful of Bitcoins, to create new clusters of addresses, but this time for Zcash. In terms of the shielded pool, we were able to define and implement our own heuristics that were able to de-anonymize almost 17% of the interactions that were happening outside the pool. Now, in when I say the anonymize, I mean that, as I showed you earlier, we were able to correlate the uh, deposits with their withdrawals. We know we knew how money went inside, we knew how money went, you know, outside the pool, and we were able to correlate the two endpoints, basically breaking uh, the, uh, the the link, basically uh, uh, taking out, outside of the equation the meaning of the shielded pool, which is to hide this correlation. Our last uh, contribution was that we used these heuristics in order to investigate the activity of a hacker group called the Shadow Brokers. You can see details of this um, attack on the paper because I'm not, I won't be able to cover it throughout this presentation. So let's see uh, what we did in terms of the first contribution, the blockchain analysis. As you can see here, we have the distribution of the different types of transactions that I mentioned earlier. 
what's important uh, to take from this uh, pie is the following, that 85% of the transaction didn't even interact with the shielded pool, were either transparent or coingent. Coingent transaction is a transaction that basically um, a miner receives his reward because he blocked, he blocked, uh, he he mined the particular block. So basically, it's completely transparent as well. So only 15% of the transaction in Zcash behaved in a different way compared to other cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. So given that uh, the, the the vast majority of the transactions were T2T -T, transparent, we couldn't just ignore them. We couldn't just rely on the fact that this work has, had already been done for, uh, for Bitcoin, we had to redo it ourselves because it was so uh, dominant in Zcash. So Lord, as I said- If you don't mind yeah. if I jump in for one of second, course. we had a of question course. from the audience, I think uh, based on the figure that you had shown about 85% yeah. of the transactions being uh, transparent. Yeah, by no. the way, really sorry, because I'm not looking at the chat because I'm sharing the screen, that's why I didn't interrupt myself. Of course, oh, yeah. you can interrupt me anytime you want. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the question was, uh, what heights or times are these data from? Uh, so this was up until, uh, I'm going to show you later, but it was up until 2018 when we stopped uh, scraping um, because we submitted our paper. Uh, however, in terms of the um, the usage of the, uh, how basically users use the shielded pool, I have a graph in the end that shows what happens up until today because I figured that this would be, you know, an interesting uh, question. Basically, we want to see how people use the shielded pool after we submit our paper, whether there would be any change. But our data covers until uh, a, a late 2018. Awesome, thank you. So, as I said, 85% of the total transactions. And let's see how we created these clusters of uh, users. I'm going to explain here in a nutshell how basically clustering and tagging works for Bitcoin and any other UTXO-based cryptocurrency. So let's take this uh, transaction over here. It's a T2T Bitcoin transaction, but as I said, it, uh, it makes no difference what it is because um, the T2T -T transaction behaves the same way in Zcash. So we can abstract it as a black, and we can you know see it as a black box. You have two inputs, two outputs. And let's assume we have you know our blockchain consists just of four transactions. Let's see how we're going to make clustering, and we're going to see which addresses belong to, to which users. First of all, we don't care about the outputs. The most basic cost and heuristic I'm going to describe just cares about the inputs of each transaction. Let's take the cluster of uh, address A. Let's see which other addresses uh, are owned by the same user that owns uh, address A. Well, we know that B belongs uh, to the same user because A and B are co spent together in transaction one. Hence, the user that owns the private key of address one must own uh, uh, the private key of uh, address B as, uh, as well. There are some false positives, of course, in this technique, which basically uh, is a conjoint transaction I mentioned earlier, but we, um, we're not gonna take into consideration in this description. Also, uh, since B is clustered, we can, you know, put it in the purple cluster we have here as well. But address C also belongs to the same cluster because it's co-spent here with A. And similarly, E. And C and E don't belong in any other transaction as well. So basically, we're done. So we have our first cluster, which basically addresses A, B, C, and E. Also, F and G uh, addresses consist of a cluster themselves because they do not appear in any other transaction. So basically, we have two distinct clusters, A, B, C, E, and F, G. You don't know, we don't know yet what, what these clusters are, whether they represent a user, an exchange, or whatever, but we know that they represent two distinct clusters. In order to find what cluster they represent, we, we proceed with the second part of, our, uh, of the technique, which is basically tagging addresses. How this works is basically you create an account with an exchange, let's say, let's, uh, say Polonix in this, um, in this occasion, and let's, uh, the user can make various transactions using Poloniex in order to obtain what we call ground truth uh, addresses. So basically the user here received money from a particular address and because he requested this money from Poloniex, he knows for sure that th this address belongs to Poloniex. Now he goes back to the clustering we did in the beginning and they, let's say that the address was A that received the money. So now the user knows that not just, not just that A is Poloniex, but A, B, C, E is Poloniex. So basically, you uh, repeat this for the entire blockchain, and you create your different clusters of users. Let's see the results of uh, the clustering we did for Zcash. The majority of the big clusters was basically exchanges, and this was completely unsurprising. The same thing occurs in most cryptocurrencies. There were two exceptions of big clusters, which was basically shapeshift, 
and uh, an exchange that is basically um, not the traditional one, but it's basically an exchange between different currencies. So instead of transacting with US dollars or you know five values, you basically just swap coins from one currency to another. The other big cluster with fun was Zcash for Win, which was basically a wallet that was created in order to run Zcash, and I think it was for Windows. So now that we've seen what happened with the transparency addresses, let's go to the most interesting part, the, the more Zcash specific parts. In particular, let's start with the transactions that are the most private ones, the ones that operate within the shielded pool. Basically, these transactions are less than 1% of the total transaction. Now, this is a very important key point to take. The most private part of Zcash is by far the least uh, used. And there, were, there are very, there are very various reasons for this um, to happen. The underlying cryptography, when we were doing our paper, was presumably secure, and we did no effort in trying to break the cryptography because it was not you know, a cryptography paper. Uh, actually, uh, I, was, I said presumably secure because at the time of our writing, a Zcash um, employee actually found a major bug in the Zcash uh, cryptography, which was uh, would if this um, you know if the knowledge of this attack was to be, uh, to go to um, an, for um, to an adversary, he would be able to create Zcash out of thin air. So basically, it was very important that it was actually found by a, a Zcash person and it was actually patched before uh, trouble happened. You can see the details of the article I'm saying, saying here. So basically, since we did not try to uh, break the cryptography, we had no obvious de-anonymization techniques because, as I said, in this type of transactions, you don't know who sends money to who, and you don't know, also know the values. So basically, the only thing you can attack, uh, presumably, it's the actual cryptography. The only thing we did was basically we created a graph that showed uh, the how uh, basically uh, uh, private transactions happen over time. And you don't know who does, uh, who does these transactions, but because of these spikes over here, there is an indication that they, these transactions, although you don't know who does them, there may be an indication that the same people do it all over again. For example, this spike over here consisted the 17% of the total uh, Z2Z transactions ever made. So probably it showed that maybe it's the same users that are, you know, uh, choose to perform in this way. So let's go now to the most you know, interesting part, which was basically to see the deposits into the pool and the withdrawals from the pool. Because in this type of transactions, we have much more information. We have, in the case of the deposit, who is sending money, and we know how much money they sent. And in the case of the withdrawals, we know who receives the money and how much money they receive. So who is using the pool? Let's try to categorize our users, and we're going to uh, split into three categories. The first category is the miners, basically. The miners come into flavor, the independent ones, the ones that operate with their own machinery and they don't belong to any you know, company, they just mine with their computer or whatever. And the mining pools, basically mining pools are companies that are specialized on mining cryptocurrencies. They have designated hardware to do so. So basically a miner has an incentive to work for these mining pools because he increases a lot his chances of actually succeeding. Uh, at the time of our writing, the, uh, writing, the miners took 10 Zcash from each uh, block mine, but because there was a halving in the protocol, now they take five. The miners, we, in order to create a, a, a trivially identifiable set of miner addresses, you can just see in the blockchain who receives the coin joints. You see who receives the, the rewards, and you make a list of your trivially identifiable miner addresses. On the other hand, we have the, the founders, which currently uh, who currently take 1.25 Zcash from each uh, mind block, and their addresses were actually publicly known. They were present in the white paper. So everyone knew who the founders are in Zcash. They published their transparent T addresses. We call the rest of the users others, and they can be individual users, exchanges, wallets, etc. So our first graph over here. Um, is the following. We show in each particular block, and by the way, since you asked our data start uh, stops, I think it was February 2018, to answer uh, you know, very concretely your question, and starts uh, before October 2016. That was the data that I'm presenting to you now, and the data that is present in the paper. So you can see in the, you know, the, the red part is basically the deposits that happen uh, at every particular block, the deposits into the pool. Similarly, in blue, you can see the withdrawals from the pool. And you can see there is an almost perfect symmetry here. Basically, this uh, graph suggests that people did not put money into the pool. They kept them there, did some Z2Z transactions, 
you know, enhance their privacy and so on. They just put them there in order to immediately withdraw, withdraw them. And the reason they did that is because there was actually a rule in the, uh, in the protocol saying that you need to um, pass your funds at least once through the shielded pool. So basically, this graph suggests that people use the pool because they had to, not because they wanted to. Um, there are some exceptions in, the, in this uh, symmetry, which is these spikes over here that we actually analyzed in our paper because they were just very interesting. You can see details on um, who we think these spikes belong to. So let's see the deposits into the pool, right? And as I said, we identify what type of user category does these deposits because we have the, the sets of trivially identifiable minor addresses and the trivially identifiable founder addresses. And we see that almost 80% of the total deposits into the pool happened by the miners, which actually it was not surprising at all because miners take 80% of the each uh, block reward. Uh, although the miners put the most significant amount of uh, Zcash in the pool, the founders are the ones that create these little spikes in the um, graph of all, which suggests that although miners put in total more money, founders put bigger values. So they put, you know, uh, uh, bigger values each time that made these spikes. On the other hand, when we try to use the same set of addresses in order to see who withdraws the money, we were not as effective uh, at all. And in particular, you see that almost 90% of the total withdrawals were unknown. We didn't know who they belonged to. The, the, the set of addresses that we saw on the withdrawal side, we had never seen them before. And we, we, they were neither trivial identifiable minor addresses or the known funder addresses. So this graph basically give, gave us the motivation to create our own heuristics for tagging more addresses and creating more heuristics for tagging transactions. Let's see how we try to um, correlate founders' behavior, and in particular, how we try to correlate founders' deposits to founders' withdrawals. The founders, in the majority of the cases, deposited a very unique value in the pool, this value that I'm showing over here, 249.999. Uh, there were actually zero withdrawals of this particular value. So we couldn't just see uh, when the known founder addresses received money because they didn't use them. They also, uh, never withdrew on the same value, which show, suggested that we, we had no uh, idea in the at uh, in the start uh, at starters to see how they withdraw money. However, we tried to um, identify which users withdrew another very unique uh, value, which is the two fifty point zero zero one value. And this value, as I said, is very close to the two forty nine. So we immediately saw that there may be a correlation. What's more, we try to plot the different deposits I mentioned of value 249 and the withdrawals of value 250. And as you can see in this graph, there is a strong time correlation as well. Basically what happens is that the withdrawals of this unique value happen a couple of blocks after the deposits and they happen just in the smaller steps. If you take this particular subgraph, uh, for example, you can see that there is a very big spike of the deposits of 249 and there are very many, many smaller steps that, but actually that lead to the same value of the 250.001. Hence, this strong correlation led us to a heuristic that said every withdrawal that's carrying this specific value, we believe to have been done by the funders. In order to argue about these false positives, I want to say that the values that were around 250 but not, um, but not happening from the founders were just five in the deposits of the pool. So basically, in the vast majority of the cases, more than 99% of the cases, when we saw a value around 250 deposited into the pool, this was from the founders. The results of our heuristic is the following. You can see that the, um, basically the line of the founders increased from zero to basically um, our maximum in terms of the withdrawals. Now let's see the second uh, category, which is basically the mining pools, and in particular the mining, uh, the, uh, the big mining pools. We investigated more than 15 uh, different ones, and as you can see, the graph by far the most dominant ones were fly to pool and F to pool. Uh, currently, there are other um, um, pools that are you know more effective than those two, but at the time of the writing, this one, the, these ones was were the most dominant ones. And let's see how the money pools uh, behaved in terms of their usage of the shielded pool. What they did was basically they accumulated many different rewards from several coin chains, and they consolidated these rewards to one particular address. I call them the money pool address. This money pool address is the known money pool address for each. Um, uh, for each service. They actually publish this address. And the reason they do that is because they want to see 
they want observers of the blockchain to know how effective they are, that they're very effective in order you know, to attract more uh, miners to work for them. So basically, they, they accumulate this reward to a single mining pool address. What they do is that they make a single deposit of this very big value. And what we observed on the, the withdrawal side was some transactions that had hundreds of recipients, and the last recipient usually was this mining pool address. So basically, this unique behavior led to, uh, to our heuristic about the mining pool saying, saying any withdrawal that, is, that has more than 100 output T addresses and one of them belongs to a known mining pool, then we label this withdrawal as being done by the particular uh, mining pool that we observed on the, um, on the last address. In order to argue about the false positive here, with, um, here I can say that the inclusion of a mining pool address makes it very unlikely to be a transaction that's not correlated to, to this particular mining pool uh, service. These are the results of this particular heuristic. As you can see, the line of the, uh, of the miners increased uh, a lot. It went from, from this particular area, it was like zero and then increased up to here. Uh, actually, we, in these results over here, we did not even capture fly pool. We were not able because they behaved in a bit different way. So we just decided to exclude it. But other researchers did, and you can see this paper um, on how they actually managed to capture fly pool as well. Now, the last heuristic doesn't uh, target uh, founders or miners, targets everyone. It says the simplest thing you can say. When you see a unique deposit into the pool, a very unique value that you have never seen before, and you also see on the withdrawal side a unique value that actually happened a couple of blocks after this unique deposit, then you need to correlate these two, um, these two transactions. In order to argue about the false positive of this particular heuristic, I can tell you that almost 99% 90 of these unique values had three decimal points, which means that they were value with high, uh, very high entropy. It, was, it would be very, uh, um, the probability of accidentally having the same value is very low. So the key points of th this uh, presentation is to say that usage of the pool was very limited, and actually it still is today. So basically, the first big question is how to give incentive to the people to use it. We need you know, um, to motivate people to use the pool more because it's very likely that the people that you know, got the anonymized bar techniques wanted to remain private, but they didn't know either how to use the pool or it was very difficult you know, um, because of the implementation. So those people that actually do use the pool, they do it in a bad uh, way. So we need to give incentives to the people that actually use the pool to do it basically in a better way. The underlying crypto is still um, is still secure because, as I said, the developers uh, patched the um, the problem. So basically, the Zika, Zcash has the potential to provide much better anonymity than Zcash than uh, sorry than Bitcoin. But some uh, uh, solve, some issues are remain to be solved. So uh, this was the presentation. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions you have.